Good morning, Calvary. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. Um, I would like us to start a little differently this morning. Before we do our call to worship, uh, I would like us to have a word of prayer. Um, and I would like us to come together as the body of Christ to support another branch of the body of Christ that is truly hurting uh, all of the information about uh, this uh, these brothers and sisters in Christ has been released in the paper today. I've been a part of uh, understanding this and had inside information on it for several weeks and been praying about it, but today the uh, official story of it was released in the newspaper, uh, and uh, we need to be praying for our brothers and sisters who are seeking to remain faithful to the truth of God's Word down at Valley Brook Church and for the healing and the recovery of that church and anything we can do to come alongside of them to assist in that process. We want to make ourselves available to them and to those people to show them the grace of God, and I think we need to pray for them as we begin our service this morning. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Father, how it must break your heart when the people called before the foundations of the world suffer so severely at the hands of others who for whatever reason have abused their call and how your heart must break that the grace provided in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior has been so abused to cause so much damage to the name of Jesus in any community but now right here in our community and I just pray that as your faithful servants we will rally around those who are seeking to remain true and faithful to the Word of God that you would bring healing and restoration to this church that you would bring your spirit to bear upon the lives of those who caused this and that they will be humbled before you knowing that even what has happened can be forgiven by your amazing love and your amazing grace and that there would ultimately be reconciliation of individuals restoration of the glory of the name of Jesus in our community and we give you praise that we have been put in this place at this time to be the representatives of that redemption and that we will do our best to reach out in your love and embrace the hurting and restore the wounded and to reconcile to you and to ourselves and to others those whose relationships have been broken. And we give you praise and thanksgiving for your grace upon all of this. Amen. Amen. Please stand with me. Today we wrap up my portion of our series on Get Fit. And all God's people said amen. I know. We wrap it up with our final message from 1 Timothy on what it means to get fit. And it means to train to be trustworthy, to pass on the truth. Not to pass on the truth. <laughs> to pass on the truth. Put the emphasis on the right syllable. <laughs> and today we want to focus in our time on the foundation of that truth, the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Listen to these words in 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. 
In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's why we're here, to celebrate that Jesus saves. Amen. Satisfies my longing as nothing. 
You may be seated. Welcome. It's great to have you with us on this beautiful Sunday morning. And if you're watching on the internet or on television, welcome as well. It's great to have you. If you're a visitor with us this morning, thanks for stopping by and checking us out here at Calvary. My name is Matt Selbig. We've got a couple of announcements for you this morning. Uh, first of all, if you're a new to the congregation and you want to know a little bit about what the core of uh, Calvary is all about, the foundation, uh, this would be a great class for you to attend. It's going to meet uh, every Wednesday on a five-week rotation. And Wednesday nights is normally the evening, but now this Wednesday night, uh, they will not be meeting because of 
the Awana Awards program. So you can certainly still come out and support that. I'm sure they would love that on Wednesday night. So come on out and check that out. But they will not be meeting. CORE will not be meeting this Wednesday. They'll start the following, and it'll be a five-week, every other Wednesday um, situation there. So, And if you want more information, you can get more out at the Connect desk as well. All right, it's time for the Ministry Minutes, talking about the Beloved Brunch. Check it out. Hi, I'm Erin Selvig, the coordinator of the Beloved Women's Ministry events. I want to invite you to a brunch open to women of all ages, Saturday, May 2nd at 10 a.m. This is going to be a time of fellowship as well as a chance to learn about the upcoming events and Bible studies available for the women here at Calvary. I'm personally looking forward to an opportunity to get to know the women here at our growing church. I want to thank you all for your prayers and support, and I will be seeing you May 2nd. Okay, so May 2nd, uh, any ladies, you are invited May 2nd for the brunch. Now, Erin, my wife, she will be standing in back at the Connect desk, and she will be taking um, names. If you are interested in coming, please get signed up on the sheet that she will have available back there. Uh, it doesn't mean necessarily that you're definitely written in stone, but we're just looking for a head count as far as food and whatnot. So if you're interested, again, May 2nd is the date, Saturday morning, a great time for Ladies Fellowship. It's the brunch, okay? Let's take a moment right now as the ushers come forward, and uh, we are going to pray for the uh, beloved ministry, which is a new ministry and one of many ministries here at Calvary, and we're going to uh, pray for those ministries right now as we continue our worship through our tithes and offerings. Lord, we thank you so much for uh, laying this ministry on Aaron's heart and uh, on the hearts of uh, some other ladies here in this church that... Um, that you would bless this ministry and that this ministry would take off and that the connection between the women in this church would continue to blossom. We thank you so much for blessing our church with wonderful ladies uh, who are godly women and who seek you with all of their mights, with all their power and all their strength, Lord. Uh, we thank you so much for uh, the beloved ministry along with a number of other ministries that you have blessed us with here at Calvary. We ask this morning, Father, in Jesus' name, to uh, bless the tithes and the offerings that your people have given faithfully and with a joyful heart this morning so that the ministry, uh, the good news of Jesus Christ, can continue to reach people here in the Chippewa Valley and uh, throughout this entire world, Lord Jesus. We love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. As we're taking the offering, just a couple of other announcements uh, for this morning. Okay, so Crave. This is neat. This is a cool thing. Maybe some of you partic participated in it last time. Basically, it's a little get-together, a, uh, a little potluck, if you will, and we know how to do that here at the Baptist Church, all right, if you know what I'm saying. So we've got three different dates, May 3rd, 17th, and 31st. Now, if you, if you think back to how we did this last time, we did it according to the alphabet, right? This time, we're going to change it up a little bit. We're putting a little twist into it, okay? Yeah, check this out. So May 3rd, if, you're, if the head of your household has a birthday in the months of January through April, then you're going to come to the May 3rd event, okay? May through August, if you have a birthday, you're going to come to the 17th, and then September through December is the 31st, okay? So we're going to get to, again, mingle with some new people because that's what we're craving. We're craving the fellowship, okay? So you can also find that out more in your uh, worship folder. So make sure you attend the Crave on one of those dates coming up here in the month of May. Finally, this morning, Merge Young Adult Life Group. This is awesome. Perfect. Right in my age group. All right? <laughs> 18 to 29. I'm still there. At least in my mind, anyway. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, Jordan. Sunday night, starting tonight. Thank you, Jordy. This is going to be great. Uh, Talon is starting this, um, and this is going to be uh, this is going to be just an awesome event. Uh, so you got to come out and plan on attending if you are between the ages of 18 and 29. Okay, this is going to be at Drew Pastor Drew's house. Address is right up there, and the first night of that is going to be uh, tonight. And Kylie is also in on this too, so we want to make sure that we. 
thank both of you ladies for kind of putting this together. College age students, young adults, please come. This is going to be a lot of fun and be encouraged in your walk with Christ. Finally, for all of these uh, information, for all these announcements, stay connected. These are all ways that you can stay connected here at Calvary. Make sure you look at your worship folder and uh, make sure that you find out exactly what's going on and stay connected. Those are the announcements for this morning. Please rise as we continue to worship this morning our Savior, Jesus. Forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. Everything I believe in, I surrender, and I surrender, I surrender all to you. Savior, he can move the mountains, my God is mighty to save, he is mighty to save forever, author of salvation.
That's all I had to say was, well, uh, this is our sailor time. You may be seated. Um, it's a time we reflect upon the greatness of our king. What a mighty God we uh, serve. Our God is mighty to save. That's an incredible message, an incredible truth to sing. Uh, what a mighty God. And uh, he is mighty to save. Uh, our Selah time is a time that we reflect upon we've, what we've just sung. It's all, also a time that we pray together as the body. And so we're going to ask you in a moment to form little groups and, or right where you are and pray together. And, and this morning we have several of our church family that have special prayer needs. And so I'm going to mention them very quickly and remember to pray for them. And if, if you know where they are and I'm... Uh, I'm not sure uh, one of them's here. Some are in the hospital. So uh, one is Kelly Adkins, uh, one of the families from our church. Uh, last Yesterday fell off her horse, uh, broke her ankle, uh, is in the hospital, and uh, will remain there until they get some swelling down and are able to uh, repair and, and uh, fix the broken bones in her ankle. So remember to pray for uh, Kelly and the family. And then Cara Winsink, just uh, pray with uh, the Winsinks and uh, difficulty uh, and uh, that God would uh, sustain the pregnancy and that uh, the baby and Cara and that family would know of our love and know of our great God that is able to meet every need. And then Linda Roberts is in the hospital. Uh, she's been in for a week. And they're doing some changes of medicine and trying to get her uh, uh, more stable and, and some uh, help there. So remember to pray for, uh, for uh, Roberts. And then Kathy Holloman. Her brother, uh, Brad, has had two uh, heart attacks recently. He is not a believer. She's praying for his health and for salvation for her brother, Brad. She also has, Kathy has a great granddaughter, Kalahia, I think is the pronunciation. She's one and a half years old, and they found a mass behind one of her eyes. So uh, pray for that little one and a half year old uh, girl. So as we go to prayer, rem remember these and remember to pray for each other. Uh, let's spend some time in prayer. God, as we uh, continue to pray, we realize that our uh, deepest needs uh, you know all about and you can meet every need. Whether it's when we are on the mountain 
or we're in the valley. Uh, we just pray, Father, that we would be willing to trust you and that we would uh, leave the, the individuals that we bring before you in your hands, knowing that you not only are a God who is mighty to save, but you are a God who loves us deeply and you care deeply for us. And so we trust you and we leave this in your hands. We give you thanks for all that you're doing in our midst, in our individual and corporate lives. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.
to be the tellers of the story. For we do not know who around us is ready to be one of us, brother or sister in Christ, saved by the blood of Jesus, forgiven for all eternity. But if we don't tell the story, they may never hear. So lay on our hearts the wonder of that story and let it come out of our hearts as the abundance which you intended it to be. And we thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Um, before I begin this morning, I just want to, uh, as the kids are going out to discover land, um, just want to clarify uh, something in uh, Matt's announcements this morning that uh, when he said uh, the, for the Crave meals that the, you go by the birthdays of the head of the household, let me remind you uh, in Ephesians 5.23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So you go by his birthday, not yours. Okay? Your husband is the head of the household. That's the birthday we meant. Just a just little emphasis there on what the scriptures say. And if you don't have a head of the household because you're a single parent, uh, then guess what? You are the head of the household. But if you're married, remember, it's your husband. There, that was just a free little piece of reminder of what the scriptures say today. Okay. Um, get fit. We've been training ourselves for godliness as we've been dissecting 1 Timothy, not going through it verse by verse from the beginning to the end, but taking the overall context of it and then saying, what was Paul trying to teach to Timothy as a pastoral trainee, but then how can we put ourselves into what he was teaching and gather information for ourselves? And so we uh, talked about getting fit, and we broke get fit down this way, so that get fit means grow your faith, and we did about four sermons on what it means to grow your faith, and exercise God's image now that we have faith in God, what does God look like in us, and how do we exercise that image in our lifestyle? And now, the final part, training to be trustworthy with all of that, so that when we go out into the world to represent the image of Jesus Christ in whom we trust with all faith that he has given us, are we trustworthy to represent it correctly so that the world sees Jesus and not something else? Today we're going to talk about, in the final message of this that I have prepared, Pastor Drew is going to wrap it all up next week, actually, with something God has been putting on his heart as to how to pull this all together into one point of application for our lives. And so Pastor Drew Elgersma, our pastor of student ministries, will be preaching next Sunday. Uh, but uh, today we want to talk about uh, passing on the truth, being trustworthy to pass on the truth. So I need a six- or seven-year-old child to come up here right now as a volunteer. I need a... <laughs> Jonathan, you're a little older than seven. Okay, Madeline, come here. Come on up all the way on the stage. Come on up on the stage. This is going to take a couple of minutes, but uh, you'll get the point. Come on up on the stage, and I'm going to whisper something to her, and then she's going to go out and find anybody you want out there to whisper to them what I told you, but you can only whisper it once, even if they say, I didn't hear you. Too bad. Okay? And then they have to get up and go find somebody else and whisper it to them, and they have to go up and find somebody else, and when the fifth person has heard what I whispered to her, that fifth person has to come up here and speak what I said to her to all of you. Okay? So get ready. You could get chosen. You could get chosen. Okay? All right. Jeopardy music. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. She's going to go find somebody 
to tell this secret to? And uh, who is she going to pick? Don't take too long, Madeline. Find somebody and pass it on to them. Here she comes. All right. So there's another young lady back there who is listening carefully. And uh, maybe the camera can make sure we're getting this if you're able to follow it. And then who did she choose? Oh, there she comes. All right, Savannah, who are you going to find? Oh, Pastor Josh. And let's see, Brian, I'm going to need that microphone real quick for the person who comes up, and then I'll make sure you get it back. Thank you. Who's Pastor Josh going to get? I'll bet he's, I, uh, I knew he was going to get Andrew. <laughs> All right. Okay, Andrew, one more person, and then that person gets to come up here and tell everybody what was said, and we'll see, oh, Pastor Dennis. <laughs> yeah, now, now anything can happen. <laughs> Be prepared. He's deaf in one ear and can't hear out of the other. <laughs> All right. I resemble that remark. Um, oh, it shut off for some reason. Did I mute it? You do it. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. It's on. Now I forgot. <laughs> 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 My first response was I resemble that remark about yeah. being. Yes, I know. Yeah, okay. Um, come and celebrate Dylan's birthday. He's turning nine today. Okay. The original message was what, Madeline? You don't remember? <laughs> okay. The original message was, we are celebrating Dylan's birthday today, but he actually turns nine tomorrow. Okay. So, Dylan, happy birthday tomorrow. And you can see how in five people, the truth got messed up. The truth got messed up. Uh, Brian, here you go. You can have this back. You'll need that in a little bit. Um, the truth got messed up. That's what happens if we are not careful to be trustworthy to pass on the truth. That's what we want to learn about today. How many of you remember this? If you do, join in. A spark to get a fire going and soon all those around can warm up in its glowing that's how it is with God's love once you've experienced it you want his love to every Okay, that's good, Brady. Thank you. Thank you. How many of you remember that? Of course you do. That's one of the old world famous camp songs, singing around the campfire at Bible camp or whatever. When you experience God's love, you want to pass it on. But we have to be trustworthy to pass on the truth. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to begin reading in verse 10, and we're going to read down through verse 14. Would you please stand as I read this from God's Word?
For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. You may be seated. We have to understand this truth. If we are going to be trustworthy to pass on the truth, then we must have a working knowledge of the truth. If we're going to pass on anything, we have to have a working knowledge of it. Now, sometimes, those of you that have been in the hospital and those of you that know me well know that I have this passion to understand the medical stuff of how the human body operates and works. I love visiting people in the hospital. Firstly, to be there with you, of course. <laughs> Secondly, so that I can discover as much as I can from you and the doctors and the nurses, what is this condition? And how do you treat it? And how do you resolve it? And what caused it? And I, I just, I don't know, I just have this, this insane desire to know as much as I can about the medical field and about the human body. Now I have never studied it all that well. I love the doctor I have right now because she takes all the time in the world to explain absolutely everything to me and, and uh, appointments turn into long, long affairs of learning everything I can learn about stuff. It's wonderful and she loves doing it. She, I think she loves being a teacher of it. She probably should teach in a medical school somewhere because she just loves doing it. Can we say the same thing about our passion to know the truth of God and to study his word to that depth so that we have a working knowledge of it so that we can pass it on. Let's look at what Paul says. Let's start in verse 10 and let's dissect this whole passage that we just read and see what we can learn about passing on the truth in a trustworthy fashion. Paul says, to this end we toil and strive. To this end we toil and strive. To what end? He says, to this end. What end? The end that he's talking about in context here is the training yourself for godliness from verse 7. To this end, I'm striving and toiling to train myself to be a godly person. Now, if you want to know what that means, without me having to take any more time to go back and review that, you need to get the message from that passage in this series. The whole series... Get fit, the whole series in a nice DVD folder and container with all the DVDs from the whole uh, 13 or 14 weeks worth of messages will be available for you to order at the Connection Desk after the service today, at the Connect Center, rather. Uh, you, can, you can fill out the form and you can order it, and they're $5, just 5 bucks. You can get the whole set. You can watch them and distribute them and whatever comes in DVD form and CD form so you can plug it into your car radio and listen to them if you want to catch up. Paul says, to this end, I'm training for godliness and I'm toiling and striving for it. What does the word toil mean? The word toil means to actually become fatigued. To become fatigued. When was the last time you can remember becoming fatigued at daily devotions? That you toiled so hard to learn what it meant and how to apply it to your life that it actually wore you out. You were just exhausted and drained from all the self-evaluation and the application. And yet that's the word that Paul chose here. He said, I'm so intent on achieving this working knowledge of the godliness of God in my human existence so that I can pass it on that I'm going to wear myself out making sure I get it right. And, the word, and then the word and. 
toil and strive. The word and is a Greek preposition that means to have a cumulative effect. In other words, what he just said gets added to what he's about to say so that you get a totality of what you're supposed to be doing. And what you're supposed to be doing is, in cumulative effect, becoming fatigued to the point of striving, and the Greek word here for strive means to be taunted, defamed, and to experience reproach. Get this, here's what Paul says. I am so intent on having a working knowledge of who God is and the application of his life to my life that I'm going to wear myself out to make sure I'm applying it correctly even to the point of getting more worn out based on all the reproach and the taunting and the defamation of my character that's going to come when I start to live it out in the presence of ungodly people. Are you starting to, thank you, you're starting to get an understanding of the importance of what it means to have a working knowledge of passing on the faith of Jesus Christ. You see, that means I don't care how worn out I get from either studying it or worn out I get from being accused of living incorrectly or for wearing the wrong t-shirt to school on silence day or whatever it might be. I don't care how much defamation I get. I don't care how much abuse I get, how much reproach I suffer. I am intent on passing on the truth because it's working in me. Okay? That's what Paul is saying here. The pursuit of godliness was so powerful that no obstacles, personal, physical, or emotional, could stop it in Paul's life. Now, he goes on and he says, because we have our hope set on the living God. I strive after this and I toil for this because, because is important. Every word is important in Scripture. What is our motivation for training for godliness and to be trustworthy representatives of Jesus? That's why the word because is there. It explains what he's about to say is your motivation for having this kind of working knowledge of God. Because we have set. The, word, the, the, the verb form is have set in that passage, even though it's separated by what the verb is about, we'll talk about that in a moment, we have set, that Greek word, that the text, the context of that Greek verb is in the perfect tense, which means it is a once for all decision that has an ongoing effect. You made a once for all decision, or you should have thought of it this way, a once and for all decision in the past to be a follower of Jesus Christ and to begin the process of gaining a working knowledge of his godliness and application to your life. And Paul says, the reason that I am able to endure anything from that point of that decision onward is that decision once made, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God in His grace and His provision, makes it possible for me to have that as the ongoing reality of my life every day, no matter what happens. Because I have set my hope, our hope. We have set our hope, the confident expectation that results in joyful anticipation of what is to come. We have set our hope. We're confident about this. We anticipate that no matter what happens, we are going to be provided for by God himself and have all the confidence we need in that. And that hope has been put on the living God. Hope on the living God. To be so determined to trust the living God that everything in our lives is motivated and controlled by our relationship with Jesus Christ. Can we make that statement today? We toil and strive because we have set our hope on the living God 
that we are absolutely determined and we so trust him to fulfill his word in us that our lives today are motivated and controlled totally by our relationship with Jesus Christ. A.W. Tozer, on October 16, 1977, in an article or a sermon he preached called Power for Living, wrote this. Listen carefully. There is today an evangelical rationalism which says that the truth is in the Word of God. And if you want to know truth, go learn the Word. And if you get the Word, you have the truth. Now, when I first started reading that, I thought, okay, where is he going with this? Because isn't that true? That if you get the Word, you have the truth. And some of us may think that that's sufficient, that we have the knowledge of the truth. But remember our definition. You must have a working knowledge of the truth. Listen to the rest of what A.W. Tozer says. If you get the word, you have the truth. That is the evangelical rationalism that we have in fundamentalist circles. Quote, if you learn the text, you've got the truth. End quote. He continues, this evangelical rationalism wears our uniform. He comes in wearing our uniform and says what the Pharisees said. Well, truth is truth, and if you believe the truth, you've got it. Such people see no beyond, no mystic depth, no mysterious, or no divine. They see only, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. They have the text, and the code, and the creed, and to them, they're in the truth. So they pass only that on to others. The result is we are all dying spiritually because to know the truth is to know the Son personally. We do not pride ourselves on knowing the truth. We pride ourselves on knowing the one who said, I am the truth. And it is him that we pass on. It is not the doctrine. It is him that we pass on. And I'm afraid that many of us have suffered for a long time from the evangelical rationalism of simply knowing the truth. I can spout off the doctrines and the theology, but can I pass on the person of Jesus Christ because I have a working knowledge of the truth, Jesus Christ, indwelling me. Powerful, powerful statement from A.W. Tozer. He goes on, Paul does rather, in 1 Timothy 4.10, and he says, We have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people. <laughs> now, please, this verse is not a proof text of universalism. You know what universalism is? Universalism is the belief that is promoted and propagated right now by people like Rob Bell and others who declare that in the end, all people end up going to heaven anyway and that any judgment they receive for their sin is only temporary, but God's salvation is for everyone. And here's the verse to prove it. Uh, there's a fundamental rule of Scripture, and that is this. When you interpret it, no one Scripture can ever contradict any other Scripture. It all has to be in harmony with each other. And the people who pull this verse out and say, okay, God said He is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe, which is the next thing He's going to say, especially of those who believe, but all get saved, there's just a few little extra benefits that those who really believe get. Okay, that is heresy. That is false doctrine. For the scriptures teach clearly 
that the wages of sin is death and that all who reject Jesus Christ as Savior will spend eternity in eternity in the fires of condemnation. There is no partial judgment and then ultimate salvation for everyone. That is totally out of context with what Paul is saying here. He is saying here, listen, the reality is that the redemption that was paid for by Jesus Christ has a temporal impact on all people. It has a temporal impact on all people. Temporal meaning temporary. It has a there's an experience of God's grace that exists in this world that protects even unsaved people from the full effects of evil even though they don't believe in God. There are still good people who don't believe. There are still people who do good. There are temporal effects to the salvation of Jesus. When Jesus died for the sin of the world, the power of Satan was minimized the moment Jesus rose from the dead and the temporary effects of even Jesus Christ's saving power became evident to people throughout the world. There is a spirit of grace that still exists even in unsaved people. But eternal redemption of the individual is reserved only for those who believe, especially of those who believe. We don't ask anyone to experience just the temporary benefits of following Jesus. The Bible's full of illustrations of people who did that. If you turn to Hebrews, for example, chapter 6, you would read about a group of those people in that passage in Hebrews where it says that there are those who have come into the church, they've tasted of the Holy Spirit, they've seen the work of God all around them, and they've experienced the benefits of being a part of the fellowship of believers in a church. But then they turn their back on that and they go the way of the world and they die in their sin because they have to die in their sin because once having tasted it and seen it in reality and then rejecting it, it would be necessary for Jesus to die again to offer them another opportunity to be saved when they've already rejected the one they tasted. And then the writer of Hebrews says this, in case you're wondering if the people who have tasted are saved or not, the writer of Hebrews says this, but I am convinced of greater things for those of you who believe. See, the person who sits in the church every Sunday and just tastes of all the good things of God and has the head knowledge of God and has the experience of some of the blessings and the benefits of God's people that are going on around them and they've had helping hands come minister to them and they put a new roof on their house or whatever we did and however the love of God has been expressed to you and you've tasted of the goodness of God, do you have a working knowledge of God that has transformed your heart or is it simply your pursuit to just find another place of acceptance and another feel-good way to live life? And if it is, you are not saved yet. You are not saved yet until with your heart you surrender and repent and believe in Jesus as your Savior and then Jesus becomes your eternal redeemer, not just your temporary provider of some good benefit. That's the distinction that Paul is making. That's the working knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, now that we have that working knowledge, Paul says, you've got to pass it on. You've got to pass it on. I'm, uh, I've been thinking about a lot of different illustrations at this point, and uh, because I'm, it's hard for me because I'm such a reserved and non-emotional person that I don't really pass on things very well. <laughs> yeah, Jordy, where's the drums? <laughs> uh, I tend to pass everything on. Anything good that happens, I tend to pass it on. Uh, and 
I have a son who kind of does the same thing. And I remember the day that I was at home and my phone rang. And it was my son on the phone. And I said, my first question was this. I remember it vividly. My first question was, I thought you went golfing. Why are you calling me? And he said, why else would I be calling you in the middle of a golf round? And I went, you got a hole in one. And he said, yes, I just got a hole in one. <laughs> and he had to explain the whole thing of, well, I took this club and I hit this shot and it hit the green and it rolled this way and went right down. And it was, you know, explain. He gave every detail of the whole hole in one. Because it was so thrilling, he had to pass it on. Is the working knowledge of Jesus Christ in your life so thrilling that you cannot wait to pass it on to someone? Man, it should be. It should be. And so Paul says, here's how to pass it on. Verse 11, command and teach these things. Command and teach these things. He says, Paul, look, if you've got a grip on this and it's got a grip on you, then get busy and start teaching all this stuff. If you flipped over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, you'd hear Paul say it this way. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I remember at my other son's wedding that is a part of the wedding ceremony I had a baton chrome silver baton you know from track a racing baton not a conductor's baton a racing baton from a track meet a chrome one printed with that verse on it and during the wedding ceremony I handed that baton to my son and I said now as the head of a household it's your responsibility to pass on what you have heard taught about Jesus Christ and to pass it on to your family as well. And I praise God that he is still doing that. Command and teach these things. Command. Command. Wait. Hear it again. Command. These are not well thought out suggestions for personal improvement. These are not, well, you can take this for what it's worth statements. These are the truth. Sorry. These are the truth of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ and we pass them on because they are mandates of God for anyone's salvation. Number two, Paul says in verse 12, don't make excuses or let things or people get in your way. Let no one despise you for your youth. <laughs> don't make excuses. Don't let things, and especially don't let people get in your way. If you're going to pass on the gospel, there are no excuses. Oh, but pastor, you don't understand. I, I have this incredibly shy personality. And I, I, just, I just can't talk to people until after I've gotten to know them for a while. Great, get to know them for a while and then talk about Jesus, will you? Will you just do that? Get to know them and then talk about Jesus. Unfortunately, when we, use, when we put any excuse connected to the Great Commission, the excuse becomes the procrastination of doing what we've been called to do. Because then we not only say, well, but it takes me a while to get to know someone, and then we start to get to determine, well, I don't know them well enough yet to talk that way to them. I don't feel at peace yet about talking to them. Wait, I, I need to pray more about having the peace of God to, to talk to them about Jesus. Wait, why do you have to pray about whether or not to be obedient to something God already told you to do? 
Don't make prayer your excuse. Just do what God said to do. Command and teach these things. Pass them on. And don't let anyone despise you because you're young or because you're immature or because you're a new believer or because you're a long-time believer or because your personality doesn't match up or because you're too crude or you're too, too bold or whatever your excuse might be. Don't let any excuses get in the way of passing on the truth of Jesus. Thirdly, the best way to pass it on is to live it. I'm glad Paul said this for the sake of all of those who have trouble talking to others. I'm glad Paul said this to Timothy first. He said, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Now, yes, the context is Paul's talking to a pastor, that the pastor is supposed to set this example to all of the people that he's leading and shepherding in his church. But what's the first thing that is the example in speech? I hope that you never get tired of hearing about or watching me talk to people about Jesus. And I hope that it's an example for you so that you will learn to do it and be bold to do it. But set an example for others, even unbelievers, in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. The gospel is to be modeled in our lives before it ever has to be talked about. So just do a quick review for a moment. Uh, over the last five days, any speech come out of your mouth that was not honoring to God? Any choices of conduct and personal choices of lifestyle that were not honoring to God? Any ways in which you did not express the love of God to others, but you expressed love for yourself, protecting yourself? Any way that that came out? Any way that you didn't express faith in God and you put your faith in your bank account or your, pos your position at your job or whatever? Any way that faith is not being modeled, that it's a working knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ? How about purity? Were your thoughts pure and God-honoring, not just your actions? See, the best way to pass on the gospel is for us to get it right on how we live it and have a working knowledge of it in our own lives. And then fourthly, when you have an opportunity, use words. Verse 13, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. In other words, when you have the opportunity in the midst of this lifestyle that you're living where people are starting to notice, according to Peter, the hope that lies within you. Do you have your heart fully set on the hope of Jesus Christ? Because if you do, Peter says that people will start asking you about the hope that lies within you. And then when you have opportunity, you can use words to express three things. Number one, you can pass on the truth of Scripture. You can pass on the truth of Scripture to them. I was so impressed with a Facebook dialogue that was taking place on uh, Friday concerning uh, the day of silence at a public school where one of our students became a very bold witness for Jesus Christ in the, in the midst of that. And the ways that he and his friends on Facebook responded to the reproach and the criticism of what they were doing with nothing but words of grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ and teaching them the truth. It was powerful. It was powerful. They didn't defend themselves. They didn't get angry back. They simply wrote the truth of the scriptures to those kids and adults, I think. The second thing he says is be an encourager. Do exhortation to encourage people. Come alongside people and build them up and give them hope, the hope that you have, and be an encourager to them. And then be a teacher to them. Be a teacher to them. Three things. Pass on the truth of scripture. Be an encourager and be a teacher. Now you can probably find people all around you who need one, if not all, of those three things. And that God has put them in your life because you're his representative of what they need. 
if you will just pass on the truth to them. Sometimes we need to have opportunities created for us to do that. And there is a new ministry in town that is starting as a part of an established ministry. Uh, as you know, we support here through our, through our church the Good News Jail and Prison Ministry. And the chaplain of that ministry is uh, Reverend uh, Brian, Chaplain Brian John. And Brian is starting a new ministry through the jail ministry. Brian is starting a ministry that ministers to the inmates as a mentoring ministry. And he's going to come right now and explain it to you because maybe you would like to be involved. Brian? Good morning. Thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to come and uh, share with you some exciting things that are going on in the ministry uh, in our local county jail. Uh, as you may or may not know, we have about 269 average daily attendance with the inmate population, and we work with between 45 and 50, or have been, uh, in any given week. Uh, but over the last six months, roughly, I've been working with the captain of the jail, Captain Joel Bredigan, uh, to put together a formal mentoring program, the first of its kind, uh, in this facility, which will allow us to have mentors coming in from sponsoring churches, uh, who will then meet with the inmates in a discipleship, mentoring kind of role being established uh, with the intention that once they are released, that discipleship will continue as that truth is continually passed on into the lives of these men. And of course, ultimately, the objective is uh, that these individuals are going to become part of and assimilated into a local church such as this one. Uh, because we realize that uh, individuals grow in community, we don't grow in isolation, correct? And so one of the downsides is if these individuals are getting out and they haven't established those close mentoring type relationships, uh, it doesn't typically work very well for them. So at this point in time, as I've worked with the captain of the jail, we have uh, received the okay and the, uh, we got the green light on this. We're moving forward right now. Uh, we have five churches that, are, uh, that have uh, identified mentors, evangelical churches in our community, uh, who are coming in and are meeting with these inmates and already beginning that process and continuing that process of mentoring them. You know, one thing we have found is that individuals who are growing in the Lord and followers of Jesus Christ have a tendency to stay out of jail. Have you found that to be true? There's just something about following Jesus in your life and uh, not being convicted of crimes, at least for doing the wrong things. And so we're really excited about what we're seeing happening as we have right now five individuals who are in this mentoring role have been approved are going through the training and uh, we're looking for before the year's end uh, to have five more uh, mentors who are being added to the program uh, and our our program involves one of being approved by the church because we believe it is a, a very important that the, the local churches become part of this and have the backing of the church and the pastor and these individuals then come into the facility and are trained uh, further and basically if you're good at discipleship if you're good at working with people if you have a little bit of understanding regarding our culture uh, you can be a person that can fit into that role and so we'd be excited to see Calvary Baptist become one of the churches that are part of this I know that's part of your mission I know that's part of your vision uh, to reach people no matter where they've been in life what they've done where they've uh, you know what their wrongs have been uh, whatever their background doesn't make any difference because our Savior came into the world uh, to what? Deliver us from this present evil world. And that deliverance can take place in the here and in the now. Uh, we don't have to merely wait until we get to heaven to see that total deliverance, but we believe that there can be deliverance from the addictions, from the bondage, uh, from the issues that have plagued us in the past through Jesus Christ. So you found that to be true. I trust you found that to be true. And now we want to see that being multiplied in the lives of these men and women who are behind bars. So I want to tell you about that this morning. I want to thank your pastor for allowing me to share that. If you have an interest in that, of course, I do have some uh, documents that have the mentoring program explained, uh, what the requirements are, qualifications of the individuals, and I'll be happy to meet with you about that and then uh, allow you to work through the uh, pastor and your church uh, as the Lord leads. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. So the uh, proper...
procedure here for you is if you want more information about it, go see Brian and get that packet of information. Pray over that. See if God is calling you to either be the one who goes into the jail to develop the mentoring relationship with the individual, or if you become the support team that waits for that inmate to be released and then gets involved in the ongoing discipleship of the inmates once they are released. We need all of those people. Get the information from Brian, but please go through your elder in this church to make application so that your elder can review your life with you to see that you are trustworthy to pass on the truth and that you are trained to be trustworthy and then we will make recommendation to the jail ministry for which mentors are ready to take on that role. But that's just one of the opportunities that exist here at Calvary. One more thing I want to share with you before, in fact, our worship team can even start coming now to get ready for our closing song. But there's one more thing that Paul says in this. He says uh, in verse 14, do not neglect the gift you have. In other words, be consistent. Be consistent with what God has put on your heart for your gifts, your abilities, your knowledge of the scripture, the ways that you relate to people. Be consistent. Now I know that they're all much more beautiful to look at than I am, but they'll get to their places without you watching them. Listen to this. Every single person here that is a follower of Jesus Christ has been placed by the Holy Spirit into this local body to be a working part of the body. Not just a casual attender. You've been placed here by the Holy Spirit to be a working part of the body of Christ. You've been given a gift with which to serve the body of Christ and the greater community of Christ. You have been given that gift. Please, don't let your gift get dusty. Find a way right now by talking to your elder to get involved. I'll guarantee you, bold statement, but I'll guarantee you that the critical spirits, the unrest in your life, the fear of life circumstances and how they're affecting you in any way, all of those things are the direct result of an unused gift for God. Because you have set aside what He gave you to do to pursue what you want to do and therefore you have stepped outside of the blessing of God's peace. And where there is unrest in your life, it is because you have chosen to not serve Christ and be trustworthy to pass on the truth. We have a community that needs Christ. And if we believe that Jesus is the God of this city, then we will go and represent him to this city and be trustworthy to pass on his truth. Stand with me and let's sing together.
the strength in our weakness. You're the love to the broken. You're the joy in the sadness. Yes, you are. You are. There is no one like. numbers of people around us every day who need and want to know Jesus as Savior. And they just need someone to tell them the story. Lord, I want to be one who loves to tell the story. I love to tell the story of Jesus and his love. Thank you for calling us to be part of something greater. What you have done already is great, but there is more to be done until you return and say it is done. We do not dare declare it is done for us until you do. And so may we join you today in what you have ahead that is even greater. And it all starts with this. We will be trustworthy to tell the story. And we will love doing it. Amen. You are dismissed. And there is no one like our God.